If you're over 60 and have osteoporosis, you might think that it's too late to turn things around. But research and real life results show that you can improve your bone density and even reverse osteoporosis in some cases. We'll talk about what this what it means to reverse osteoporosis. By how much can you improve bone density? What can you expect in terms of T-scores? Is it possible to reduce your fracture risk without improving bone density? And lastly, we'll give you a couple of real life case studies of people who've actually reversed their osteoporosis. Before we jump in, who am I? My name is Igor, I'm the author of the Amazon best-selling book, Osteoporosis Reversal Secrets. As well, I run an online personal training company that specializes in osteoporosis reversal. As well, I am a personal trainer myself and I've helped one-on-one -on -one personally uh, lots of people improve their bone density and reverse their osteoporosis, like Darlene here, who at the age of 46 was diagnosed with breast cancer, given um, chemotherapy radiation, and then estrogen blocking medications, her bone density went down and she was able to turn that around. As well as Laura, uh, who lives in Los Angeles and had severe osteoporosis, and she was able to improve her T-scores using the right approach, and Anne who was fit and ate healthy, and despite that had osteoporosis, tried different approaches before she found the right approach to reverse her osteoporosis. And so what does it really mean to reverse osteoporosis? Well, it goes back to the diagnosis. Osteoporosis is diagnosed when somebody has a T-score of minus 2.5. So reversing osteoporosis simply means improving the T-score from something worse than minus 2.5 to better than minus 2.5. So is it reversible? And the answer is how far away is somebody from minus 2.5? Uh, if somebody is very far away, osteoporosis is not reversible. If somebody is close, it's reversible. In other words, if somebody's T-score is, is around minus 2.7, they can probably reverse the osteoporosis and get into the osteopenia range. But if somebody is at minus 4.0, chances are they probably won't reverse their osteoporosis, even though they can improve their T-scores uh, as high as minus 2.8. But again, even for people who can't reverse osteoporosis, they can improve it and also reduce their fracture risk. And so what are the greatest possible improvements without using medications? Let's look at what the research has to say. Here's one review that looked at non-pharmaceutical approaches to osteoporosis, and they found that the maximum improvements that can be made are 0.3 to 0.5. In other words, according to this research, um, if somebody has a T-score of between minus uh, 2.7 to minus 2.9, they can reverse osteoporosis and get into the osteopenia range. On the other hand, our own practical experience, that is me and my staff members, um, our own practical experience with clients shows that T-score improvements of 0.5 to 1.2 in a one or two years uh, span are possible. So why the discrepancy? between what research shows and our own practical experience. There are a number of reasons for this. Reason number one is that research needs to isolate variables. In other words, it tests just exercise or just nutrition or just supplements. Any one by themselves can improve T-scores between 0.3 to 0.5. Research rarely tests combining all of these. Um, in fact, research never tests combining all of these. Research at best and infrequently tests combining two of these, but never do they combine all three. On the other hand, we are practitioners, we are not researchers. We read the research, we use it strongly to inform our approach, but we are not obligated to isolate variables. Our clients want progress right away. The other reason for the discrepancy between research and what we find with our own clients is that research often use underpowered doses of exercise and nutrition. When it comes to dose, what does that mean? In terms of exercise, that is the frequency, number of days per week, the intensity, the amount of weight or resistance somebody uses, and the sets and the repetitions. Uh, we use adequate or proper um, you know, exercise doses. When it comes to nutrition, as you might have seen in my other presentations, the two most important nutrients are not calcium and vitamin D. They are in fact protein and vitamin K. Even in high protein studies, they're still pretty low in protein. And so the other, uh, the, the other reason for, for this is the lack of progressive overload. Uh, in research where they do strength training, rarely do they actually raise the weights to accommodate for a person's improving fitness levels. In real life, that's what we do. You always have to improve the weight um, as the person gets stronger. The other thing that's missing in research is targeting exercises to the areas with the worst T-scores. For example, if we have a client whose 
uh, T scores are worse in their lumbar spine, we'll have them do two or three exercises for the lumbar spine, but only one or two exercises for other areas like the wrist, the hip, the femoral neck, and so on. Um, and so it's very, very important to use proper targeting. And again, protein is often insufficient in studies. Even in high protein studies, they're not truly high in protein. Here's a study that, uh, or a meta-analysis that uses the greatest dose of protein. Even studies with the highest uh, protein doses only go up to one and a half grams per kilogram per day. Even at that dose of protein, that's still very low. Um, according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, they go as high as 2.0 grams of protein per kilogram per day. But that's for an average person who doesn't have osteoporosis. For osteoporosis, the highest used in research is one and a half grams. So it's about 25 to 33% short. So why does the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics re uh, re uh, recommend a dose that is so high? So first of all, it's not really high. It's moderate or adequate, okay? Um, it only seems high to somebody who is on a low protein diet. And that's most people with osteoporosis. It's just high compared to what they're used to. And yet it's just moderate to adequate. Also, the other reason is that protein requirements increase both for people who do strength training as well as for people who are over 60. If somebody is over 60 and they do strength training, their protein requirements are what they are, 2.0 grams per kilogram per day. And so to sum up, is it possible to reduce fracture risk without improving bone density? Absolutely. There are ways of doing it besides um, bone density improvements. One of those is to improve balance. If you have better balance, you're less likely to fall. Two is to build muscle. Now, people think if I build muscle, I'm going to build bone. Not necessarily. You can build muscle without building bone. But even just building muscle without bone will directly improve your fracture risk without improving your bone density. And thirdly, you can build power. In other words, if you slip, do you have enough power to pull your leg back into position to catch you? Um, these are all ways of building, of, of, of reducing fracture risk without building bone density. Now, here are some real life case studies. Darlene, I talked about her earlier, but here's a bit more of her background. Up until the age of 46, she was very fit. She was exercising four to six days per week, jogging, et cetera. In her youth, she also played rugby as well as hockey. Um, and so it was a huge surprise to her when she was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 46. Um, so she went through a standard treatment, chemotherapy and radiation, and eventually was given estrogen blockers to keep the cancer at bay. Now, the benefit of that is, yes, it keeps cancer at bay, but it also reduces bone density. She went to her doctor, the first year after using uh, estrogen block medications and her bone density is down. He says that's normal, but not desirable. She goes back a second year and one more drop in bone density. Again, normal, but not desirable. He says, you're very, very close to osteoporosis. If this happens again next year, we'll have to put you on, um, on medications for osteoporosis. So at that point, she switched to, to a, a, the proper approach, uh, non-pharmaceutical approach to, to you know, improving her bone density. And she was able to do so because the third year she went back to her oncologist, he said, what are you doing? Your bone density really, really improved. So she was using a program, exercise, nutrition, supplementation, tailored to osteoporosis. Here is Karen. She is a homemaker out in Calgary, and she was also able to improve her osteoporosis using the right combination of exercise, nutrition, supplementation. Now, if you like this video, I have uh, lots more information just like this. I've created a special video. It's called a Stronger Bones Checklist. Six Steps to Improve Bone Density Without Medications. This video is not available on YouTube, but you can get it at www.fitnesssolutionsplus.ca slash yt-osteoporosis. It's also linked in the description below.